This is Diplomatic Ties on the Nigerian Television Authority, the NTA. India became independent on August 15, 1947, after almost 89 years of colonial rule by Britain. The Republic of India has a population of 1.2 billion and established diplomatic ties with Nigeria in 1958, two years before Nigeria gained independence in October 1960, also from Britain. Nigeria and India have been enjoying strong strategic, diplomatic, and commercial ties since then, and Nigeria is the second largest trading partner of India on the African continent. Bilateral trade between the two countries stood at $11.8 billion between 2022 and 2023, and in 2023 up to 2024, $7.89 billion, following a declining trend. Both countries are members of the Commonwealth of Nations and the Non-Aligned Movement. Both are also large developing democracies with multi-religious, multi-ethnic, and multilingual groups. India is a leading member of a new economic group, BRICS, and held the presidency of the G20 from 2022. Records have it that India enjoys great diplomatic relations with the US, Russia, and China, while at the same time maintaining an independent foreign policy posture. India became a republic on January the 26th, 1950. The country has always observed this day in a unique and special way. As history has it, the day is of immense importance, reflecting the true transition of India's journey to real independence of government of the people, for the people, by the people. Now, on this edition of Diplomatic Ties, we are going to discuss and explore further how far relations have been between the two large democracies and how they can benefit more from each other through cooperation and partnerships in various fields of endeavor. We shall also find from His Excellency here how India is successfully navigating the rough waters of international politics to the benefit of its citizens. And to give us all that information is the Indian High Commissioner to Nigeria, His Excellency Shriji Bala Subramanian. Your Excellency, you're welcome to Diplomatic Ties once more. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks for having me back on Diplomatic Ties. Let me, at the outset, say namaste from India to all your viewers. Thanks for having me. That's your greeting, way. That's right. Thank you right. very much. We acknowledge that. And, um, my name is Nancy Godi Angunihu. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us on Diplomatic Ties, Your Excellency. Let's start. Sure. Yes, what do you consider the greatest legacy of the more than 66 years of the relationship between Nigeria and India? At the outset, let me tell you, we have very friendly, good relationship between India and Nigeria. As you rightly said, we started two years before your independence, and we have been uh, developing this relationship at the highest level. As far as the legacy is concerned, I would perhaps say two things, basically. There are many more, but two come to my mind immediately. One is the best people-to-people -people relations. And uh, we have been instrumental in the capacity building of our Nigerian friends uh, from 1979 onwards through a program called as the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Offering Scholarship uh, for uh, working people in the government and other, other places uh, for short-term scholarship. So um, uh, to the tune of about 500 scholarships are given every year. And uh, you can imagine the number of Nigerian friends who have benefited out of this, and we are very happy about it. So training and capacity building is one of the first legacies. And the second legacy, I would say, is uh, the business relationship that we have. We have more than 155 Indian companies which have invested more than $27 billion in the Nigerian economy. 
they have been here for more than 40 years, 50 years. And uh, they are uh, the second largest employer after the federal government. So this is a very important economic and business relationship, which certainly uh, can be termed as, a, as an important legacy. There are many more, but these two come to my mind since you asked me about two. <laughs> Actually, very well there. Uh, Your Excellency, I'm interested in the scholarship one. Uh, is that scholarship still running for Nigerian students? Absolutely. It is, uh, I mean, we do have uh, different scholarships. One, the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation that I talked about is for working people to upscale, uh, increase the, the, to further skill up uh, people who are already working in different government departments. We offer about 250 of that every year from the civilian side. On the military side, we offer about 150 of them under the same program for short-term courses, which are uh, covering about 250 different courses from banking to agriculture to water development to computer IT specialization, so on and so forth. There are 250 courses. We are still running. In addition to that, for uh, long-term scholarship for children, for uh, students, we have something called as the ICCR scholarship, the Indian Council for Cultural Relations scholarship. This year, we are in the process of selecting about 23 of them for their uh, master's or PhD or graduation, whichever uh, they have opted for. And then, in addition to that, we have Study in India program. We also have something called as the EVBAV, which is the telemedicine and the tele uh, online courses, of which uh, nearly 5,000 Nigerian students have benefited full scholarship from Government of India. So, as I told you, capacity building is one of our stronger forte and uh, we continue to do so. Nigeria is benefiting a lot from India. What is India benefiting from Nigeria? Because it's um, a symbiotic relationship. You are a very important country in the continent okay. and in the world. You are, you are one of the uh, leaders of the global south. You are, a, you are the giant of Africa. And uh, friendly relationship with uh, such an important country is, uh, is something that we strive for. And Government of India has been very keen in improving this relationship since the time we started our diplomatic relations with you. Thank you. Now, India and Nigeria have similarities, you and I can see, especially as a populous, multi-religious, multi-ethnic, multilingual nations. Nigeria with three major languages, while India has about 22 official languages. How has India been able to maintain harmony and this whole diversity in building a very strong nation. Yeah. It's true that we have more than 22 in, uh, languages in our constitution, enshrined in our constitution as official languages. Um, there are linked languages which are existing, which, which can be hin English and Hindi, which are mostly spoken all around the place. Our uh, concept is something called as unity in diversity. Each of our states have their own language, their own culture, their own cuisine, their own way of dressing, so on and so forth. And in 1956, when the uh, state reorientation was done, uh, mostly it was done on linguistic basis. So a person from the east might have a completely different language. Say, for example, West Bengal speaks Bengali. Gujarat in the west speaks Gujarati. Uh, Kerala in the south speaks Malayalam. So each of these geographical areas have been identified as linguistic in state reorganization. And the state government has got its responsibility in terms of its development. It's constitutionally divided as a state list, concurrent list, and a central list. So the powers are divided. So it is constitutionally mandated, and there is a strong sense of democratic institutions which are there, and the judiciary is very strong. The fourth estate, you, are really very, very strong in India. So any, any issues that come up, obviously, when there are 1.4 billion people living together in one landmass as a single country, there can obviously be certain uh, differences from time to time, but we have institutional mechanisms to redress those things and uh, the concept of unity in diversity and our international concept of Vasudeva Kudumbakam, which means whole world is one family. That is the cultural construct on which India functions both politically and socially. I'm so happy you said that once in a while there is uh, friction and then the, the institutions are there to handle uh, such uh, problems. Now, India is um, one of the leading growing economies in the world. Um, it moved from food insecurity to food security. How did you achieve this feat? 
You are right. When we got independence, we had a population of about 330 million people. And uh, uh, at that point of time, because of the state in which we found ourselves, in the economic state in which we found ourselves, we certainly did not have food security. But uh, our governments decided, uh, successive governments have decided, and that, uh, in 1960s we started this concept called as the Green Revolution. And uh, uh, through Green Revolution, we were able to uh, bring in some hybrid seeds, use proper fertilization methods, uh, irrigation facilities, so on and so forth. People were taught, education was made, uh, I mean, even farmers were educated in the best manner of producing, so on and so forth. So fast forward, this particular thing has been continuing from 1960s onwards, the Green Revolution. We subsequently had yellow revolution We have uh, for pulses, white revolution for milk, so on and so forth. So every sector has been concentrated upon and food security was ensured over a period of time through this green revolution. And today with more than 1.4 billion people that we have, more than four times than what we had during our independence, uh, we are completely uh, secured. We are self-sustaining on our food supplies and we are in a position to actually export food to other countries also. So this has been a growth of uh, Green Revolution, agricultural uh, ways in which we have done that. And uh, the concentration of the government over a period of many years in developing this sector has resulted in food insecurity being converted into food security part of it. Thank you. Let's veer off now to another thing. Recently at the second session of India-Nigeria Joint Trade Commission in Abuja. The two countries signed agreements on early conclusion of local currency settlement system. Please tell us more about this. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have wonderful business relationship, trade relationship between the two countries. Uh, uh, you rightly pointed out that there has been some decline in the past two years in terms of uh, the trade relations between the two countries. That is basically because of the oil trade, okay. where you have uh, you have been now reduced the amount of oil that was coming over to India, and you have started uh, maybe to the Ukraine war to other play other players. Russia. You have been doing that. Yeah. Uh, any two governments will have to look at issues of developing the trade relations between two countries and. Both the governments, both India and Nigeria, are interested in increasing the trade between our two countries and uh, diversifying the trade also. So the governments, it is the duty of the government to provide some institutional mechanisms, whether it is the double taxation avoidance agreement, whether it is the bilateral investment treaty, whether it is the local currency settlement system, whichever facility that can be provided for our business people to trade easily. Yeah. It is the responsibility of the government and that is what both our governments which are interested in increasing the trade between our two countries are working on presently. Uh, the way it sounds, uh, okay, what's the time frame uh, for this to happen? Uh, looking at um, um, the way this it sounds, it's like there's an urgency, early conclusion you know, of the uh, currency agreement. So. It is always important that we, whenever any negotiations take place, we will have to look at some time frame and we'll have to see how we can facilitate that. So this Joint Trade Commission, which was held in April this year, uh, looked at the various things that are pending and both the sides said that, yes, these are necessary institutional instruments that have to be put in place. Negotiations will take its own time, obviously, but uh, there is a clear intention on both the sides to conclude it early. I wouldn't sure. be able to say when or how soon, but there is, an, uh, there is a sense of urgency amongst the uh, two governments to ensure that we facilitate trade development between our two countries. Shortly before we go on break, please, um, does your government grant special trading privileges to Nigerian business uh, enterprises because of the long period of um, friendly uh, relations between the two countries? See, uh, both, of us, both of us are members of WTO, yeah. and uh, the preferential trade uh, is always there. There is, uh, you would be treated exactly as the other one, and there will be no discrimination against Nigerian trade uh, business people to come coming to India. And similarly, there are no such restrictions on the Indian companies coming over here. Uh, we are more than happy to welcome Nigerian trade. Very recently, let me tell you that in the month of March this year. Uh, there has been some $10 million investment from Nigeria 
into the automotive sector in India. We, we, are, we welcomed it with uh, both open hands. So yes, okay. there are facilities which are existing. That's, that's encouraging, Your Excellency. Now, um, we take a break. You are watching Diplomatic Ties on the Nigerian Television Authority, the NTA. Indian High Commissioner to Nigeria, His Excellency Sri G. Balasubrimenian is here, keeping us up to date on relations between Nigeria and India. We continue in a moment. <laughs> Thanks for staying with us. Now, Your Excellency, we hear that India and Nigeria are looking for, or they're looking at market access issues. Are there more areas of um, future cooperation with India in several other sectors? Certainly. Uh, agricultural uh, export between the two countries is something that we are working on. Uh, fisheries is another part. Uh, there are various other areas in terms of uh, um, market access from both the sides which are being discussed. So diversification of trade is an essential part of the growth of trade and economic relations between the two countries. There are traditional areas on which we have been trading over many years. So it is imperative that we look at various different areas, whether it is the ICT, whether it is FinTech, whether it is the, uh, for example, we have something called as the Unified Payment Interface. It's a uh, trading mechanism, uh, financing mechanism through mobile applications and so on and so forth, artificial intelligence, so on and so forth. These are various areas in which we want to diversify. And market access is also part of the same discussion that takes place between the two countries. Okay, what's of Nigeria-India status as Commonwealth nations, how are the two countries utilizing this on the international scene? Let's move on to that scene now. Yes, both of us are uh, Commonwealth countries and uh, uh, even during the Chogam, we, our leaders meet and the facilities that are extended for both trade, extradition, and uh, cultural connect between the two countries under the Commonwealth platform is fully being utilized by both the sides. Um, uh, scholarships which are being uh, opened up under the, under the scheme, training part of it, uh, exchange of uh, personal and exchange of curriculum in terms of training, all these are... And support at that level like at the UN and all that. Uh, we have uh, multilaterally, we have aligned our positions in a very close manner. Mm -hmm. And being, uh, being part of the Global South, being part of the Commonwealth, certainly helps us in aligning our positions closer. Thank you, Excellency. Now, India belongs to a new block called BRICS, comprising Brazil, Russia, India, um, China, yes, and South Africa. What does India benefit from this membership? And equally, what would um, BRICS portend in the present um, global economic space? BRICS is a group of countries which actually, as you rightly pointed out, the five countries which are there, and which has now been expanded in the South African summit last year to further countries also. It's, a, it's not a very new one. It is already uh, 16, 17 years old. The 16th summit is to take place later this year in November or October in uh, Russia. So br uh, these are countries which are geographically apart from each other, but in the developmental phase, they all seem to have a similar trajectory or a similar market and similar composition of uh, population, so on and so forth. So this, uh, these five countries have come together, and uh, it is not an economic block as such, but it is a group of countries which like-minded uh, policies, like-minded uh, positions. And uh, we coordinate amongst all the five for certainly economic development. Under the uh, BRICS, we have a new development bank that has been created, which provides loan and facilities for developmental and infrastructural developmental activities. So this, this is a group which certainly comes together and provides an opportunity for us to interact globally also. Okay, as a known peaceful nation, is India still available to play any major role in contributing to international peace and security and the international political arena? 
Our leadership has time and again said very clearly that dialogue is the only manner through which it would be possible for us to arrive at any solution for any difference of uh, things that are there between the two countries. My Prime Minister is on record bo and uh, both uh, when he had spoken in terms of the recent conflict situations wherever it has been, uh, my Prime Minister has been in record talking to the leaders of all the sides, urging an early settlement through dialogue process and to desist from violence. So this has been our position and India is more than willing to continue to uh, do it in the same manner. Okay. Uh, what have been, have been actually, if any, the greatest challenges facing Nigerian-Indian relationship over the years? Can you point at any at all if absolutely you know. none none absolutely it's been a none. very smooth relationship it has been a wonderful relationship that we have between india and nigeria we have only seen opportunities that exist no challenges i think the two countries understand themselves absolutely that's just the understanding uh, is key there um are there areas you think india can help nigeria um, you know in its attempt to grow its democracy and economy especially we certainly cooperate with Nigeria on all fronts, which is also including the uh, aspects of how elections are being conducted in India. We are very happy to share the experience of conducting elections. We just had elections in which 960 million registered voters were there. Uh, the parliamentary elections which was held in the month of April to May, and oh sorry, May to uh, June we had those elections. And 60% and, uh, of that, 648 million have actually voted. So we would be more than happy to share the experience of conducting elections in a vast scale. And the manner in which we use the electronic voting machines, the manner in which the, uh, the uh, counting is done, how the campaigning is done, so on and so forth. So uh, that plus the training part of it, we are, our election commission is more than willing to see how we can cooperate in this area also. We are open. Now, before I let you go, I uh, guess, uh, Your Excellency, <laughs> Your Excellency, each time you come here, anyway, um, are there areas you think that Nigeria and uh, India can improve their relations? Um, as I told you, there are uh, huge opportunities existing between our two countries, whether it is in the trade and economic relations, whether it is people-to-people -people contact, whether it is in the international arena where we cooperate amongst each other. Uh, there are excellent opportunities that, uh, that are there. And our people, both our sides, are qu our people are quite sharp and they are quite entrepreneuring. So they always, they are very enterprising and they always find best opportunities to avail of for the betterment and for mutual benefit of both the sides. Uh, artificial intelligence, financial technological areas, um, UPI is something which I mentioned about, which is a unified payment, payment interface. In India, that has actually revolutionized the process through which we make payments. Nearly 46% of international, I'm not talking about India alone mm -hmm. over here, but international mobile transactions take place on this platform. We have offered this platform to Nigeria, so that's another new area on which we can do. Recently, Namibia had also signed it. There are more than 22 countries in the world, including uh, France and other places, UAE, Singapore, and there are, I can name all, the, all of them. So this, the, this, pla this platform has been there for uh, all our uh, friends to develop our bilateral relationship as well as internal economic uh, movement of uh, money and uh, trade and other things. So this is also there. So these are some of the new areas on which we can certainly cooperate in future. That platform is there for Nigeria to actually copy what you are doing. Uh, and utilize. I would use. <laughs> utilize I would as utilize. well. <laughs> now, Your Excellency, each time you come on this program, I will always ask you this question. Is it because India is known to parade the most beautiful girls in the world? that you don't allow other nations like Nigeria to marry them in spite of the cordial relations between your country and our country, Nigeria. You don't want us or you don't want us to have beautiful people like your people? N Nancy, Nigerians are lovely looking. Mm -hmm. Nigerians are very friendly. Mm -hmm. And the concept, at least the idea that you have that there are no marriages taking place between India and Nigeria mm -hmm. is wrong. 
I have here in Abuja many of my Indian friends who are married to Nigerian girls. That's fine. And Nigerian men many. married to many. And Nigerian men married to Indian girls. And uh, even there's no prohibition, no inhibition, no um, uh, barriers. I don't think love has because any boundaries. It does it, okay, love <laughs> actually, love plays that role. Love Can has no boundaries. Every boundary. That's right. You're right. On that note, Your Excellency, I want to thank you for coming on Diplomatic Ties. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you for having us. Namaste once again from India. Thank you. Thank you. It's been worth our while watching Indian High Commissioner to Nigeria, His Excellency Shriji Bala Subramanian, educate us on the beautiful, flourishing, age-long relations, bilateral relations shared by India and Nigeria. We can only wish the two countries the best. Diplomatic Ties returns to your screen same time next week. This is Nancy Godi Angonihu. Thanking you for watching.